Hello, and welcome to Beyond the Point podcast with me, Allie Christensen. I'm curating the content I wish I had had as a dancer and creating strong, healthy, thriving dancers for the future. Not only am I your host and ex-professional dancer, but I own Align Fitness, a cross-training studio for dancers here in Costa Mesa, California, and am the creator of online courses for dancers such as the Dancer Strong Program, Lower Body Flexibility, and Turnout for Dancers. Welcome back dancers. Today I am speaking with someone near and dear to my heart, who is someone who's influenced me in my dancing, my upbringing, and also in who I am today. Uh, I have choreographer and teacher Lindsay Folkman on the podcast, and I'm really excited for you guys to listen. I asked her to come on because her journey through dance is not what the typical dancer may think it is, where we train classically in ballet, or you go to a school that tailors you to be a choreographer. Uh, She has had quite a diverse dance upbringing, never thought she would end up where she is, and now is an award-winning choreographer um, in Utah, does musicals, works with drill teams, uh, has YEGP, the list goes on, and she is unbelievably talented at bringing a story to life on stage. So I'm really excited for you guys to listen. Uh, This was someone who I grew up with who really changed and opened my eyes to what the dance world could look like and what movement could look like. And I, I do credit her to some of the knowledge that I have and the desire to find each dancer's uniqueness, uh, the way that each dancer can move well and healthfully. I realized before, and as I spoke to her even more that some of the ability that I have to look at movement and say, what's going on in a dancer's body how do we make this work for each dancer stemmed from her and from her training and her teaching and her coaching. Uh, so I'm excited for you guys to listen in on our conversation and to hear about her creative process and how she is where she is today. Uh, enjoy. This is a fun one. Hi, Lindsay. Welcome on the podcast. Hi. So Hi. excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. So for everyone listening, this is Lindsay Folkman. She is kind of my growing up dance hero. And you don't always get the chance to come back and talk to that person and hear what they experienced and share what was going on during those times and farther on. But Lindsay really was a teacher and choreographer that showed me that there was more in the dance world than my little town could could give me. I grew up in, um, well, a, a normal little suburban city, but our dance studio was very small, very humble. Uh, we, at the time, I don't think the studio was turning out professional dancers left and right. We were dancing for fun, but working really, really hard. And Lindsay came into our uh, studio and I realized now you were very young when you came. Oh, yeah. Very young. And we'll, very, we'll get into right that. out of college. Yes. Right so I think I met you when I was, I don't know, maybe like... 14 or something around there, maybe. And when I hit 22 and I realized that's how old you were when you came in and the things that you did and the way you shook up our lives and showed us how much was possible really blew my mind at that time. Um, Really? So anyways, for everyone listening, uh, Lindsay, I'm going to let her introduce herself, but uh, she is now a choreographer. She works with dancers um, in Utah and other places and has really, really come into her own in the way that she brings dance to the stage and whatever stage that is. So I'm really excited to talk to you about your journey. Can you give everyone a little introduction? Tell them who you are, what you do, where you're at. Okay. I'll do my best, but I'm sure the questions will kind of help answer that. Yes, too. absolutely. But um, yes, I'm Lindsay Folkman, and I've been teaching dance. Probably, I actually started teaching dance when I was in high school, and um, and I continued a little bit through college. So right out of college, it was just where I felt comfortable. So I went right into teaching, and I've taught at several um, studios, but I went right into ballet studios, which is funny because I didn't train heavily in ballet. Yeah. So I went right into teaching ballerinas, though. Um, and which we can talk more about that, but I'm still with ballet studios. Right now I'm with Central Utah Ballet. Um, mm-hmm. We're in Lehigh, Utah. It's directed by Jenny Kerr King, who is awesome. Worked with her for years. And I um, I would say since how oh, I was with you. So I've been directing like a senior studio dance company and a contemporary program for 20 plus years. Mm-hmm. And every year there's some contemporary show that I put together and it's always something new. I haven't actually ever redone anything. 
So there's always something new. And that's what I continue to do. But I, I actually am branching out now. Um, I love musicals. Huge fan of Broadway. Yeah. So I've done a couple musicals and I'd like to kind of do more. Um, but I've also do like freelancing with competitions, solos, ensembles, or pageants, um, drill teams, even drill team is still big here in Utah, very competitive. So I just kind of, wherever someone needs me, I go. Yes. So I'm going to do a little bit more summing up for Lindsay here. So okay. Lindsay is actually voted Utah's best choreographer seven, seven. six or seven times seven. in the, almost every year, guys amazing choreographer. Um, you've choreographed for YGP and been recognized there. You, as you said, you've now done musical theater. So I think was your last thing you did a Christmas story. Yeah. I heard amazing things about the whole production and specifically the choreography. Oh, great, um, thanks. I think that Utah has very talented dancers, very talented artists, uh, very and bringing talented children too. Bring yes. them into Christmas story. That was so fun to work with those kids. Yeah, they really the 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 kids are are just phenomenal. There's so much appreciation for children doing an extracurricular and really diving into something. And then the dance world has just exploded since I was young. And even at that time, there were so many dancers, but now there are so many artists and dancers of all ages in Utah. So I think it's perfect that you were able to take your choreographic genius and put it into an, an amazing group of people that the, I think it's the Sierra who put uh -huh. that one yes. on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's actually great. A volunteer theater, which is amazing that there's yes. just so much talent here in Utah that we get great talent going to where they're just volunteers and they just want to do it for fun. And they're amazing. I love that. I yeah. love that. And, you know, we, I think we all have a picture in our mind when you think of the volunteers, but I have seen clips and this year specifically, I've heard more random, amazing things about the Sierra and their productions than I think I've ever heard growing up or in the past year. So whatever they're doing right now, um, and bringing you on as well has, has really upped whatever's happening there. So it's, a, it's really amazing to know that Utah has such talent there. Yeah. Um, but with the musical theater, you also work with the drill teams. I saw, guys, not just drill team, <laughs> just like what you think of a drill <laughs> no, team. No, you need to see Utah drill teams. They are insane. So I saw a picture, and I've been wanting to ask you about this. I saw a picture of dancers on stilts. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's their show routine. They compete with three um, pieces every year. It's They're called military, dance, or show. And I usually do their dance and show for one particular high school, which is actually my high school. She's the director that I had. So I'm just connected to her. Mm -hmm. So I go back to her. But um, that show routine was um, their idea was dragons and Vikings. So we had about, I think it was eight of the dancers on stilts in full dragon costume. It was amazing. That's so amazing. I want to see that clip because I, I saw that picture and I thought only Lindsay could come up with this and be in a high school auditorium on the slipperiest floor possible. Right. <laughs> like, we'll come up with amazing choreography that is on stilts. <laughs> so. They are awesome. And it's a great drill team. They've won state three, um, five of the last seven. Oh, wait, no. I, I know it's a lot. I think it's been five times, but I can't remember exactly. I'm so sorry. But, no, that's but, great. And this is uh, Dixie. So it's a pretty yeah. small part of Utah. It's, in, I mean, I know it's grown a lot, but it's still, it's still a smaller it's part a small. of the state. Yeah. That's St. Awesome. George. Yes. That's awesome that they've been able to grow like that. So yeah. as you have come through and you've done all of these things and there's been many opportunities for growth, which I, I think you maybe just leaned into and gone with, but leading up to this, um, you said you weren't cla really classically trained, a uh, right. little bit of ballet, some jazz classes, like yeah. just probably it sounds like a, like a extracurricular studio activity. Like, yeah, did you yeah, have any goals to be in this world later on in life? Did you want to be a dancer? Did you want to be a choreographer? You know what's funny is um, I remember always wanting to be a marine biologist, which huh. is uh, I wanted to go into college. I wanted to go. This is funny, but um, work at SeaWorld, animal mm -hmm. rehabilitation, swim with the killer whales, all that. But I looked at a book that my mom wrote for me. When you ask your little kids things, 
She, every year when we were in elementary school, at the beginning of each school year, one of the questions was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And from kindergarten through second grade, my answer was dance teacher. So my little self must have known yeah. when I, I totally changed paths and wanted to go into that other area. But um, I ended up with being dance teacher. So my little self knew. But yeah, St. George was really very uh, small at the time. It's, it has grown and their dance options have really grown as well. And I, when I go down there, they have a lot more technical training studios. But when I was there, it was really small. And um, I started with, do you want to just kind of know how I started? Yeah. Okay. Go. So, you know, what's sad. I'm going to be honest. What's sad is that I wasn't, I can't say I wasn't, I, I wasn't proud enough to be vocalizing where my training was. As, as I've gone up and worked with Ballet West Academy, where every other faculty member had this intense ballet training growing up and danced professionally, and here I am from St. George. I kept my training quiet, kind of. I, I let my work speak for me, but they didn't know where I came from. And that's kind of sad when I think about it. I'm like, why not? Let's, it's, it's okay. It's okay that I started very tiny. And so in this little um, town, we, there was this, I guess, very popular group for little kids to be in called the Super Steppers. That's Ooh, I love that name. Started. <laughs> <laughs> the Super Steppers in St. George, Utah. But, um, you know, that director, her name is Eileen. She still stays in contact with me. And she still, you know, shout out little congratulations if I do something or she's so proud of me and I love Eileen so um I did that all growing up and it was a jazz based little place for young dancers and um you know what she did great though was we learned how to perform I think if anything if I if I if I could take out what I learned from Super Steppers was how to create joy on stage and express it and um and we worked with really large audiences. Our small little studio, Eileen found us, uh, we, we performed at halftime shows for the LA Lakers mm -hmm. during the big Lakers dynasty of the eighties. And so, you know, we got to meet like Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like it was so cool. And she even took touring groups to Japan. And so she did really awesome things for our tiny little selves. Um, once I, and she only taught up to high school age. Super steppers were just for littles. And so once you're in high school, again, there wasn't much option. So then I ended up going into drill team and that's the same drill team that I choreographed for. And we did great. And I would say from there, I've, I've been trying to like piece together. What have I learned from each of these little steps that I took? In my drill team experience for three years, I would really have to say our director, um, Laurel Peterson, who is the same director today. She really shaped me as who I am as a teacher. Um, she was tough. She expected a lot, but she, I knew that she cared. She really cared about like what's going on in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. And so where I, I do that, I can, I can be, you know, really high expectations. You need to be there and you need to do your job, but talk to me and I'll work with you. And I know what you're going through. And, and so that kind of director student relationship I took from her, but also I also, I learned how to coach pieces really well. Um, one thing I've noticed working in so many places is that many dancers will compliment me saying, thank you for helping us be feeling so prepared before we're on stage. So many choreographers are still teaching movement up to like a week, a few days before they're on stage or changing stuff in the dances. Yeah. Backstage. We're like, yeah. oh, let's do this instead of this. Just yes. totally redo it. It's fine. <laughs> yes. And that is not how drill team works. You prepare and you get it done and you have to teach the students to peak at the exact right time. Don't overwork them. Don't underprepare them. And I learned that from Laurel. And so I, and I've taken that all through my many years of teaching in studios. And I, I can say that I learned how to coach really well from her. You know, and I'm going to just cut in right here, but that's something that I learned from you too. So it's cool to hear this um, generational thing that's been passed on and where you learned it from, because honestly, you know, there's people in my past that I can say, I, you know, I learned this from here and I really learned this lesson being here and there. But when you came in and then worked with us for several, several years, um, that was the first time we had experienced or I had experienced being so prepared and also a high, a high expectation of showing up and being our best 
but knowing that it was okay if there was something going on, how can you be your best at that moment? That was something I absolutely learned from you. And I think that's one of my strengths in the dancers I work with now in a different field in dance, but is the expectation is high, but it's assisting dancers to expect high from themselves, not from an outside source. And that's what you gave me as a teacher and choreographer and director was I wanted to do well. I, the, the information that was given to me, the choreography that was given was great and amazing and gave me something to say. So I wanted to give even more so that I presented it, that I felt it, that I honored what was given to me because it was kind of a, uh, I mean, it was a relationship where we came together on both sides. So it's just cool to hear that where you learned that from and now knowing that you're still passing that on to thousands and thousands of dancers. I hope that they're also taking that into whatever areas they end up in life. I hope so. Yeah. That's great to hear that it moved on to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So after you joined your team high school. Okay. So then I graduated, I went to Brigham Young university in Provo, Mm -hmm. Utah, and I dropped dance. I I thought my high school experience was it for me. And I didn't feel like I needed to go more because remember I went into as marine biologist major. So yeah, now marine biology turned out to not be just swimming with marine animals. Oh, <laughs> There's really? There's a lot of science. To <laughs> and Dang science it. is not my forte. So, so um, I, I did stay with it for about a year, but I was like, yeah, it's not, it's not my thing. Um, still love marine animals. You can but just now, go swim not, with the dolphins somewhere yeah, else. <laughs> I'll have to pay, pay money for that now. Yeah. But um, anyway, so I, I remember the very first, it was a Wednesday, a very first Wednesday of that first semester when I was a freshman, I saw just a flyer that was up in the hallway and it was for the auditions for the BYU International Folk Dance Ensemble. And I had never even seen them perform, but that day I was like, I miss dancing. I'm just going to go to this audition just to dance. So I go and I made it. Now that ensemble is, a, it's like a tier program. So there's mm-hmm. beginning teams, a backup team, and then the tour team. So I made the beginning teams as a freshman and I wasn't sold on it that first semester. It was a style of dance that I'd never done before. They weren't doing all the turns and the technique and the, the tricks that, you know, I grew up doing. It was smaller, subtle movements with deep rhythms, which, you know, I just hadn't experienced, but it, it wasn't, I didn't feel that first semester as technically challenging as I'd want it to be. But then the very first show that we did, and we did it at Christmas time, I saw the tour team for the first time and what they were doing was spectacular and they are still spectacular for today. So talking to your viewers, if you ever see the BYU International Folk Dance Ensemble on tour, you must go. Really, it is it is incredible. And that was not a genre that I ever considered that I thought would be technically challenging uh, or I I'm gonna say honestly at the time didn't think it was really worth a show but when I saw it and then later on we started practicing it mind blown oh yeah. my gosh and the and the BYU uh folk team the traveling team is pretty elite they are they're yeah. pretty high up there in the world ranking of folk teams exactly yes we I got up to the tour team when I was a junior and ended up doing five years of college you know just credit wise taking five years. You just so wanted toured. to do another year of the folk true. team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did tour with them for three years. Mm-hmm. And we went to let me let me think. Uh Eastern United States, French Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand. And then my third year went to all of British Isles and Belgium. Wow. So those are the places I got to go. And we would hit festivals, uh inter- international folk festivals. And what was really cool was that all the other countries would be sending their paid professional folk teams. And America was sending BYU volunteers, college students. Yeah. And we were representing America. And so it was really great experience to us to just like meet people and learn new cultures. And so, I think that's what I loved about folk dance. And now I can shout out for direct, my director for that. And what he told me, my director was Ed Austin and he, his love of people and humanity and different cultures that it was so awesome to experience and, and learn that love through his eyes. And so that has really affected me. And again, what I can take from that director is um, 
just learning to love every single person and that to know every single person has a story, whether that be your individual story or your culture's story. And it affects who you are. It affects how you can learn, um, what you want to learn, how you relate to each other. And just to love everything about these stories gets mm-hmm. you to love each person. And so that is kind of what I've taken into teaching. Like each, each of these dancers, even though they're young, they have a story and I don't know it necessarily, but I can love them for their strengths and weaknesses. And, and that's what makes them beautiful. Yeah. You know, something that is, has come up a lot, um, building a relationship with a few sports medicine doctors kind of sidestep, but we're coming back to it. I promise. Uh, is they ask me all the time when I, when I have injured dancers and they go to them and they say, well, can you just not do X, Y, and Z, which is always a lot of things. Right. Mm-hmm. And they say, can, well, can, can you just not do this? Because as an athlete, there's certain lines that they're like, okay, so they're not going to, they're not going to do this position or they're only going to play for this amount of time, or we're only going to allow these movements. And then they're benched. That doesn't happen in dance. Uh, it's not the common practice. And they always ask me, well, can the choreographer, they don't know this is what they're asking, but can the choreographer make something different for them? And most of the time the answer is no, like, no, they can't. It's a group number. They can't, but there's so much possibility when you look at dancers and say, what are their actual strengths? What are the strengths they don't know that they have? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that, so you think you can dance way back in the day was really great at this. And this was something that actually Lindsay and I, we would go over to Lindsay's house and watch. So you think you can dance (laughs) every week. And then we would try the crazy things that were done and say, Uh could we do that? We could do that. And we'd be trying to flip and partner and do things in her like little tiny, uh, living room. Uh, but the ability to choreograph to your dancer's strengths, both as a group and as an individual is actually not something that's very common. I'm finding, um, mm-hmm. when I look at dancers movement, something I do common commonly with my private clients is they bring in their choreography for competition or their solos. And then we look at it and we say, okay, you have to be able to do this. We are going to be working on this out of the studio so that you can do this well. And sometimes I'm kind of shocked about what the choreography looks like as a soloist when if say it's very leggy, I'm like, mm-hmm. you're not really a leggy dancer. Like right. you're a very grounded dancer. You have a lot of rhythm. You're a good turner. Why is the choreography so leggy when it's a solo? Mm-hmm. That's something that I don't think a lot of choreographers and teachers, mm-hmm. uh, especially a studio level, pay attention to. And I think I, I feel like this is one of the reasons that you got, um, besides your brilliance, but the, the boost of your choreography skills was being able to make dancers who are not technically perfect. That was me, by the way, guys, that was me. Uh, who is perfect? No Honestly, one is perfect. You know. Um, but not Ali was really not perfect. Uh, you, were brilliant. you made us, you made all of us look our best and, I felt so good about what I was doing that I wanted to do better and Mm -hmm. it hence back to that cycle. So that's, you know, that's something that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. You know, that it came over time. I I can't say that I started teaching right away with that idea. Um, It's like, so I graduated BYU folk dance. This is interesting too. Again, not knowing plans, things just happen to fall into place and you you don't see it happening until you're old and you Mm -hmm. look back, you're like, Oh, that, that was meant to be, but I graduate, I needed a job. So, um, there was actually a dancer on the folk dance team that had to turn down a job. She, she had just gotten a job at Academy of ballet to teach ballet and, uh, ballet and jazz actually was going to teach too. And she's like, now nah, I'm moving now call and see, you know, if I recommended you. And, and so I, I called and, um, Lynn Thompson. So I talked to her and she, offered those two classes to me. Now, remember, I've grown up doing jazz, jazz and competition, and then into, and also at BYU, I was a, a modern major. So I, I, mo- I majored in two dance styles, folk dance and modern. And modern, mm-hmm. that was my first experience there at BYU. And so I, that's my training. I didn't have too much ballet other than just the required courses mm-hmm. for a dance major. So when she offered me ballet and jazz, I needed the job. <laughs> and I was like, 
okay. I I'll teach whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I think, something I learned growing up too is, um, and through my career, say yes. You just say yes. yes. Say yes and you figure it out. Fake it till you make it. You just go. And um, I have done that on several occasions. And granted, these were littles. I would not have accepted like the highest ballet. Yeah. Because I wouldn't have felt, you know, that I could do it. But yeah. little ones, I'd be like, yes, I can. Even though I felt nervous, I said yes. Mm-hmm. And so um, yeah, I went into that studio and that's where I met you. And within, I think it was only six months later starting, she put me right into that senior company. Like mm-hmm. I was, she just bumped me right up because she saw what I was doing with the jazz classes. Yeah. And um, so then I stayed with you guys for seven years. I think it was seven. Yeah. Crazy. So I must've been even younger when I met you. Um, but you're, so your choreography, I think that this spot in life being at the studio where we met, um, you know, I taught for them. I also did a couple of the companies as I got older. Uh, and I know that there was a lot of choreographic grace that was given. Uh, every studio has their things, but, uh, you know, you were, it seemed like you were able to take your idea put it into play and probably not at the grand scheme that you can do now. Actually, I know not at the grand scheme that you can do now, but you really exposed us to at the time. Remember this was 20 years ago. That's weird to say, but it was 20 years ago. Uh, It was not very common to mix styles like, Mm -hmm. and if it was done, it was done really poorly at the time. Uh, It was not common to have props that were really well done in the choreography. It was, I think it was starting to happen. We were starting to see it uh, a couple years later on. So you think you can dance and, you know, all these other things, but you were really, especially for the area, bringing something new to us. And, um, you know, you talked about your teachers that had given you the, the joy of performing and really feeling that and bringing something to the stage and honoring all the kids and each individual story. Mm -hmm. And that's something, as you were saying that, I thought that's what your choreography is, yeah. no matter what type of movement, genre, or uh, level of dancer you're working with, you are a store, a very much a storyteller and it's done really, really well. I remember there was, I don't remember what the um, dance was called, but we had long sleeves, point shoes, and yes. uh, it was like very straight faced. I don't uh-huh. remember what it was. So first time we were doing quote jazz on point, which was very, like very forward thinking (laughs) at that time. Um, But we had these long sleeves that were kind of like geisha like in my memory and the way that we used them and danced with each other. And we were completely straight faced, I think the entire time. And that was the Mm -hmm. first time that I was like, is it okay to be on stage and not smile? That was a (laughs) legitimate question because everything else had just been like, you go on stage, you do the kind of the same happy dance and you're smiling and you're performing. And it was my first taste of performance could be more than a smile and it could reach someone deeper. You could affect joy or excitement or sadness without my face being smiling. And it Mm -hmm. sounds kind of funny because I know now there's so many, there's a lot of amazing choreographers and we're very creative on stage at this point, but Back then, that's not what was the common. Yeah. Did you know you wanted to like, okay, I'm going to push this boundary or was it just in your brain and you're like, oh, we're going to put it on stage? I think it was just in my brain. If I could say that, because I can't remember thinking I want to push boundaries. I, yeah. I wasn't like a goal. I don't remember thinking that, but I, because of my background was so varied from little super steppers to drill, to modern, to folk mm-hmm. dance, teaching ballet teaching ballerinas at a ballet studio there's so many different levels there that to use the dancer's strengths and how my mind worked and what my background was I had to mesh somehow mm-hmm. so it just kind of happened um yeah. I wanted and it's and when you say you're a storyteller I think that is my strength if I if I could just be honest about yeah what my choreography is I I my whole goal really is that the audience feels something Um, not just watches a piece and feels impressed, like, wow, that's really impressive, or that's beautiful lines, or they're so strong, but actually feels the emotion that is on the stage. I want the, I want the audience to get there. 
And so I think that, so that goal with my background and the dancer strengths, it all just kind of blended into a beautiful pie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Baked in a pie. Yeah. <laughs> and it was different. Yeah. And it would just be different each time. And, you know, I've, ever since I was little, this is funny, ever since I was a tiny girl, I remember listening to music and I would see stories in my head, mm-hmm. like music videos. I would see these little little snippet movies play out in my head if I listened to a song. And that just went into my choreography. I still do that. I'll hear a song and I see from beginning to end what's happening. And then I just have to try to recreate it on stage. That's amazing. It it's really is a it really is a gift at the level that you're talking about. Um and at this point, if you aren't already thinking I have to go check out Lindsay's website, then you need to go check out Lindsay's website and look at some of the clips and things there. Um it's she really is very, very talented in bringing a story to stage. But I'm kind of going to fast forward. There were so many amazing years that I had and a lot of um, oh, wonderful moments. And I think that I want to actually want to take a second for all the dancers. I hear a lot of dancers say, well, I'm not fill in the blank trained or I don't really know how to do X, Y and Z. Uh, Lindsay is a perfect example of jumping in with both feet and making something happen, both from the place of, I don't know how to do this to, it hasn't been done. Uh, you instituted in our ballet studio, uh, a folk class where we, I think we did a couple years of different genres and we've just learned how to move in a different way. Uh, you brought in Irish and clogging and, uh, we had never done any of that stuff. We were probably terrible (laughs) at it. You probably made us feel so good about ourselves. Um, but, uh, you, you put into play something that wasn't, there was not a space for it and it, it worked out, uh, you made it happen. So for all the dancers that fall into the category and whatever that means to you of like, I can't do that. There's not space for that. It hasn't been done before. I'm not trained enough to do it. I, I know that that's not true. You do have to have the gumption to make your vision happen though. And that happens in every aspect of life now. Um, It's not just in the dance world, but I think that we get so stuck on this is how dance should be and whatever that means to you, because everyone has a different definition on where they came from. Um, You know, if you hadn't ended up on the folk team, if you hadn't done drill, you would have had a different definition of what dance is supposed to look like. Uh, And, you know, we all have those categories that we fall Mm -hmm. into, but anyone that's thinking it's not, there's not a space or I can't do it. There is, we create space and we, we make room for improvement in our visions and, uh, you know, bringing beauty to the world. You got to make space for it. No one else is going to do it for you. And that's what you, you have continued to do is make space for yourself and your dancers and the vision. And it continues to grow from there. That when you were talking all that, like I had so many ideas of like, yes, I can talk about this and I can say this. And then, and mm-hmm. as you kept talking, it would like, I hope I, my brain can come back. So I'm going to try to do this the best I can. Mm-hmm. But um, when you're saying someone, if a dancer doesn't feel good enough, best thing I can say is that I still don't feel good enough. Isn't that sad? Yeah. <laughs> like all of us have these demons of self doubt and it is something I still struggle with yeah. being around faculty that have gone so many places and I'm still little Lindsay from St. George that still gets in my head to this Mm -hmm. day. And, um, I, it's probably a good thing that you're interviewing me because I still struggle with that. What's my next step. Mm -hmm. I know there's more rungs to the ladder that I have to climb. And there Mm -hmm. are more shows that I want to do that are in my head that I still say, how can I do that? I, I can't get past this. I don't look good on paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, people have to actually see what I do. And that is something else that you have to try to conquer in this small dance world where you have to uh, um, apply for these jobs and and look good on paper. I trained here. I trained with this person. That didn't happen with me. So just to help them feel comfortable, it's probably something that will never go away, but you just have to keep saying yes to the opportunities that come. Trust where you came from. And every now and then, like I said before, stop and just take a look back. Where have you learned? Who have been your directors? What have they taught you? What can you take from them? And how has that made you you? Um, I 
I know there was more I wanted to say. Um, when I work with dancers setting solos, you had said how, you know, a leggy dance doesn't work on some. And I learned how to do this after I had babies. Mm-hmm. My body didn't move the same. Having babies really changes you. And so where I used to choreograph kind of on me and set them on my dancers, once I've had babies, I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't move the same. I couldn't do all the things I wanted to. So I was forced to learn how to communicate my ideas through communication rather than showing all of the things. Yeah. And that has made me, I think, be able to go so many avenues in my choreography from drill, pageants, competition, ballet competition like YAGP to performing, storytelling things on stage because I, I watch what that dancer brings to the stage. And um, for any choreographers out there, this method really helps with solos. I never have choreography set. When I go meet with a soloist, I know the song we'll be using and I may have a concept in mind as an emotion I might want to put on stage. But my very first thing that I do is I send them their music first and I say, come prepared to improv for me. Just dance to this song. And I sit back and I just watch them. I watch which leg they favor. Mm -hmm. If they're a flexible dancer, if they're a strong dancer, if they're a turner, if they have these awesome like core movements like you see in contemporary and modern where they're really expressive. And I see what their strength is. And then we just start building from there. And then when they make a mistake, like let's say I'll set a, a sequence of movement and there might be something tricky inside it. And if I see them fall out of it, I say, well, that's great. Let's go with that. Where is your momentum taking you? We will continue with that movement from there. There is no need to try to like force you to do exactly what my idea was. Let's just work with how you fall out of that piece and then we'll move on. Um, So I I know that I started talking about how I I veered off because I started talking about how I was teaching for differences and not really about feeling your differences. But I think when you have... um, the correct mindset to know that those little in life moments where you fall out of your turn and you have to just keep going. That's what you have to keep doing and make the next move work for you. If that helps and I'm a little symbolic. Yes, I like it. I say something (laughs) similar all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You have to make it work. Yeah. Oh, you know, I remembered one thing you had said, um, I don't know why my mind went here, but this is interesting. I didn't, I still didn't know that I was supposed to be a choreographer. Like, you know, I was teaching dance. I enjoyed it. I loved working with you guys, but it wasn't until there was one year when we did the wizard of Oz retelling Mm -hmm. and, and Allie was the witch, by the way, viewers, she was amazing. I was the witch because I'm a very grounded, scary dancer. And she was awesome. (laughs) Not a leggy (laughs) Dorothy dancer. So (laughs) there you go. (laughs) But in that theater, there was this, poignant moment for me and I sat in the back row of the theater and there was this moment where the there was silence we had set something in silence and you were circling our Dorothy Stacy and you we had you slide off the stage and you went off the stage now I'm sitting in the back row and I see the entire I'm talking the entire audience it was silent through the silence there were no kids talking no whispering no checking of phones And when you slid off the stage, the entire audience as a whole leaned forward. And so I'm sitting there in the back row and I'm like, that was amazing to have set something where the whole audience is engulfed in what this story is doing. And it hit me so hard. I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be telling stories on stage to make these audiences feel something. Mm -hmm. And, and probably because I love musicals and Broadway and, and to, I don't see. I wish I did. <laughs> but it's like my little choreography world is trying to create mu- dance Broadway musicals. Mm-hmm. I tell stories through dance and we can't yeah. sing. I don't sing. So the body sings the words, but it tells a story just the same. And and that's that's my very favorite thing that I love to do as a choreographer. I have to tell you this and I'm going to try not to cry because I don't think I've ever told this story without crying. <laughs> so okay. do my, I'm going to do Here my best. <laughs> okay. It was in, I think it was 2018. I set a, 
a story called Unspoken. It was an original story. And did you see that one? I saw clips of it. Okay. And what the concept was, was having dances, um, movement portray certain emotions. But it wasn't like a recital set where I'm going to just do sad, happy, you know, whatever. But I had actors on stage telling a story through almost pantomime because they didn't have microphones or anything. So through their movement, you could see they were going through a story and it showed her childhood and falling in love, having children, having their oldest child get sick and pass away and the grief that went through that. And so while you're seeing the actors play through those events, dancers were creating that emotion in their movement. And so if someone had ever been in that situation in any of those little moments of our life that are so life-changing, they could see the movement on stage and they were like, I've been there before. I knew exactly how that felt. And I couldn't put it to words because sometimes, you know, em- for emotions, words can only do so much. Mm-hmm. Movement can say so much more at about an emotion. And so when these uh, this audience is watching all this happen, they're actually feeling exactly what those actors were feeling or portraying. And it wasn't just watching it. They were feeling it. And so there, and it ends obviously so emotional. It's like the most emotional show I've ever done. I had to be one of the actors because of the, the mother role. I couldn't find an actress that could jump in and I had to do it. And I, I'm telling you, cause I'm, I was even nervous to do this interview to be on stage again. I was so terrified, but it was a beautiful moment. Cause I had one mother and this is where I'm going to try not to cry. But um, she, she grabbed me after the show and she said that her daughter had passed away at about the same age as the daughter that is portrayed in this, in, in this story at around um, like eight, nine years old. And she, she passed away in her, in her bed, which is, was also portrayed in that. And now obviously I had, I had no idea, mm-hmm. but it was almost like it was telling her story. And it, then I had a scene of grief at the funeral where everyone is sitting and holding still and the mother is still as can be, but the dancer was portraying this agonizing piece that was improvised with chairs where she just was feeling all of this grief and she was trying to contain it to, to hold still. And, um, but the piece was gorgeous. And that dancer, Cicely read, nailed it um and so after that show that mother came up and told me that she felt exactly how that was at like at her daughter's funeral trying to contain all of her sadness and yet she was bursting she said it had always been an ugly memory for her but ever but when she saw and spoken she says that ugly memory disappeared and now i could see that that pain is beautiful and and the pain that we can go through is a beautiful it's beautiful for us. It's our story. And again, we go back to stories, but to know that something that I just thought up in my head helps even one specific person conquer her grief in a new way was so life changing for me. So again, sorry, I can't do that one without crying, but I've had some beautiful moments with parents and the many stories that I've told through the years. Unspoken was a big one. I've had emails come in and people text me still four years later, saying how much they saw parenting differently or they, or they saw their children differently. So sometimes you just like hit a thing, I hit a moment. And you're like, yep, that's what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is what, this is the, this is the art that we want to see where we, we experience and it changes us from the inside out. I, I hope that everyone has seen something like that somewhere in their in their dance life, whether they are just a viewer or a dancer, but those are, those are the moments that I think make us enthralled with movement, with dance again, whether you're a viewer or a doer and, you know, in um, past episodes, I've in talking with professional dancers, something that's been coming up is talking about how, how the art, well, I should say how the, the, what happens in the studio can be so detrimental for dancers that they decide to walk away, uh, that it's literally too traumatic for them to continue. 
and they, they step back, they don't see dance. They never go again, or it takes 10 years. I had a similar experience for different reasons. Uh, we've had Catherine Morgan on who has had shared her experience. We were talking about how, if this continues to happen, we're not going to have viewers in the seats, watching the art, paying for the art so that we can experience this. So you can choreograph. So dancers can be on stage, but it, it, on the flip side of that, it is those moments that you just described where somebody falls in love again. And you realize this is what I came for. This is why I'm here. It's to experience something. And I, I want to be here. And that's what puts the butts back in the seats, basically. Um, I think that helped dancers too, because for as many comments as I had from the audiences through my shows, they would also tell the dancers that Mm -hmm. they they would let them know that they were moved. They felt you. And, and that the dancers, it seems, I I, I don't want to speak for them, but it seems like all the dancers I've worked with through the years also fall in love with that to know that there is a way to go on stage and, and create something that makes the audience feel and and you start to be addicted to that feeling that like, I don't want to go on stage if I can't get this audience to feel something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm like going back to maybe the latest thing that I've seen where I felt that, but also your, your pieces, there were things that I felt when I, I was a dancer for you. Um, This happened when I was at lines, lines ballet, there were, choreographers or people that when I was watching, when I was in the audience, I was so in their movement and so in the story. So not just like you said, like, oh, wow, that's a beautiful line or wow, that's a talented movement, but so in it that there's like little tiny twitchy movements. And I'm like anticipating what's happening as I, my body moves with them. And I see that sometimes in the audience when I'm watching uh, a very emotional or something that's uh, a story very deep, not just a performance piece of how, how high can you kick? But I think that there's this, it's like almost like a little dance spirit comes into the audience's bodies and you start to see that lean, like you said, or the, like the little twitches that happen that I think are totally unconscious. You don't realize you're doing them until someone's like, why are you moving (laughs) or whatever? But there is something that, that happens inside of us when we see a piece like that. And the, the older I get, the more I'm in the dance world, the more picky I get about what I'm seeing uh, because there's so much dance and I want to support my, my dancers, but I'm really in search of things that make a difference in my life and change, change my life. Not just, a, you know, I'm, nothing wrong with the nutcracker, but not just another nutcracker uh, or another recital, but things that actually make me question and change who I am or kind of put under microscope. What am I feeling? And why am I, why am I feeling this? Why is this so emotional for me? Uh, in whatever reason. Getting after yourself or still not, not feeling good enough. Um, I, part of me not feeling great about what I do is that I can, I can be honest about it and say my movement itself is not like uh, mind blowing, cutting edge, super creative like I can look at contemporary pieces out there modern pieces and they are amazingly creative in the way that they move their bodies my movement itself is still fairly simplified now that might be because I'm still working with students and as the majority of what I work with are students and so they're going and so you know I'd make them look beautiful I'm not going to go too tricky on them Mm -hmm. but um my strength is this is the emotion and the storytelling and I still have to tell myself that to this day, that even though I'm not getting all these critics, shall we say, um, loving my cutting edge creative movement in this modern and contemporary dance world. But when I get the mothers coming to me with tears and give me the biggest hug about what they learned watching one of my shows, that reward is so much deeper and keeps me going from show to show. I, I, even though I have a few awards under my belt, I don't have, I don't have the ballet world behind my back, Mm -hmm. you know, which is so, I, I absolutely get what you, what you mean. And I know uh, what you mean, but you work with some of the best ballerinas in Utah. Yeah. 
it's it's amazing. And I think that this is to go go to show that what we there's always more to go. There's always mm-hmm. more we can have, but also you you're making something incredible with incredible dancers, but with what you have. And that's a that is an amazing group of dancers that you have. So I don't mean that in a, love in my a bad way. I but, love my dancers from 20 years. Yeah. It's crazy how a dance teacher can love each dancer yeah. so much like their own daughters. Yeah. But I would love to get you a crop of professional dancers with unlimited budget and a stage and see what you could do. <laughs> I have so many stories still in my head. So many, like yeah, whole stories. I like believe you. My Pinocchio, which I think you saw, was mm-hmm. uh, awesome. I was super proud of that. Again, done with students, um, but the two leads were professionals or former professionals. And that was so amazing and rewarding for me. And, and I still get people asking, when are you going to do that again? And, and, you know, I don't know. But I have so many stories, Allie. So, like, it's going to have to happen. And, again, that's where I have to get out of my head. And, I, you know, who do I have to meet? Who, who has to see me? Who has to approach me and say, hey, let's help you get this done? Because I'm telling yeah. you, if I, if I did have that ability, the funding and the dancers and the location – I have several stories that would be mind blowingly awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I believe you. And I will be They're flying like in, in there when that happens. So <laughs> I hope, I hope, but you never know. I know. What do I have to do to get, get there? But isn't that all of us? What do I have to do? To yeah. I think you have to keep saying yes. Again. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. Keep saying yes. So if anyone wants to come approach me, I will say yes. <laughs> she will say yes. Yes. She'll say yes. <laughs> Um, well now you're, you know, in all of your yeses, you've, you, uh, ended up teaming up with, um, Jenny Kirking, who is a phenomenal trainer, um, of dancers, ballet coach. Uh, you've had some time with ballet West and gotten to work with them. And now you're, you said central ballet with Jenny. Lehigh ballet, yeah, in Lehigh. Central, yeah. And, uh, you guys, you continue. I think that Jenny does such an incredible job training artists and technicians, but her, her philosophy and the way she trains dancers, I keep applauding her for it because it really is very good training with, without crossing over into, I think the land of too much in the ballet world or too aggressive, not kind. There's a, there's a, there's always a line of, I think in the ballet world and she appears to do a really nice job. And then you have these dancers who are so moldable and that you continue to train to be moldable and get to use them for your choreography. So it's a, it's a good mix in my opinion, what you guys are Thank doing you. together and what Jenny has put together and allowed you to do is phenomenal. And I hope that it continues. Thank you. Yeah. Well, where can everyone find you, your information. Um, I'm hoping that a wealthy benefactor finds you after this podcast. <laughs> right, let's do it. Uh, maybe they could also find me. So <laughs> <laughs> we're always looking. Yeah. Um, so my my uh, website where you can contact me, you can contact me through there, or also just see pictures. I only mm-hmm. have a few videos on. I haven't put as many videos on, but um, a lot of pictures of all the shows I've done, and that's just lindsayfolkman.com. So it's spelled L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-F-O-L-K-M-A-N, lindsayfolkman.com. I also have a little Instagram page, Lindsay Lindsay Folkman Choreography, which I do every now and then, post something. It's not as extensive as far as the Mm -hmm. pictures go, but keep you updated on what I'm doing. Yeah, that's great. And we'll post all that stuff for you guys in the comments. But everyone, really, go take a look at what Lindsay is doing. Um, I think that what she has created and continues to create for the dance world. And I mean, her pocket, which is pretty big in Utah, but um, it spreads farther. As you hear, I'm a Lindsay fan from 20 years ago. Um, Her work has definitely molded what I do now, Uh, even though I'm not on the stage moving my body in that way anymore. um, All the information, all the knowledge that I gained from working with Lindsay has translated into my ability to work with you guys in the stu- in the cross training studio and say okay how does this cross training movement make your extension of how you move through space the energy you put into it the control you have to shift your weight so you can explode into the next motion these are really 
I'm not just saying this. This is why I have her on. They're really honestly concepts that were started from Lindsay. And I hope that everyone has a teacher like this somewhere. Um, if not, you can have Lindsay. So you can find someone that I hope everyone has had and will continue to look for someone like that. Um, and the wonderful thing now is that the, the world is so open with uh, internet, <laughs> With social media, you can find these people. And that's my goal on this podcast is to connect you with, connect someone with someone else in the dance world that gives you insight into your own body and your own training, whatever that looks like, whether you're a professional or um, doing this after you put your kids to bed, whatever it is, we're still looking for growth and mentorship and things to work towards. And I think that Lindsay is someone to keep your eye on. Um, both for your own growth and then also for our masterpiece that we hope is in the big stage one day with all the professional oh, dancers. You are so very kind in the way you describe me. I hope you are right. I am absolutely right. <laughs> Lindsay is very, very humble. And uh, I had to, I had to assure her that this was the right thing for her to do. <laughs> to come on the podcast. So. I know. You know. People have asked me so many times, oh, you must miss performing. And I'm like, no, not one bit, not at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up dancing, you're performing. I think I remember I liked it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you I, found I that's probably calling. why I went right into teaching after college. So I, I, I don't need to be on stage. Uh, my very favorite thing is to set something on these dancers. And then I always take front and center row. They always know they're going to find Miss Lindsay front yeah. and center on every performance because that's, I'm going to be, I'm going to like watch what was, what I saw in my head come to life. And that's my, that's my reward. That's, that's where I'm happy. And so, yeah, you saying let's interview you. I'm like, I don't need to do that. But she said, yes, guys, she said, (laughs) yes. So so wonderful. Uh, So you can find her on her, uh, on her website. And uh, if you guys are looking for choreographers or, teachers or guest artists or guest choreographers, I highly, highly suggest that you look and reach out to Lindsay and see what, what she has to offer for your studio, wherever you're at. She, we're going to say yes to things. So (laughs) thank you so much, Lindsay, for coming on. Thank you everyone for joining Lindsay and I, this was a really fun conversation. I hope that you guys enjoyed listening in. Uh, If you are new to the podcast, there are so many episodes. We have a teachers, choreographers, directors, physicians, PTs, photographers, everything on the podcast, all to assist you to be the best dancer and version of yourself. If you haven't left a review, you can do so on iTunes. You can also do so uh, if you're listening on other platforms by Googling Align Fitness by Ali. And you can just leave a review right there on Google, mention what podcast episode you loved, why you loved it. And that's a way for the podcast goodness to spread as well. And I will see you all right back here next time on Beyond the Point.